Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I promise this will be very short and sweet, but very informative and potentially rewarding for you. Um, so welcome, this is the Promoting a Sustainable Future for All Through Climate Change Impact, Training, Education and Advocacy. I'm Asma Idrisu, I'm the CEO of Inceptima and we were established in 2014 um, to really work with partners around the world to make an impact. We have USAID experience. Um, we are women and minority owned. And of course we work with you know, global partners around the world on uh, environmental and social um, corporate governance issues, as well as we develop custom training programs. We work with communities around the world to develop custom training programs um, in technology. We also help women and children in internally displaced locations around the world. Our team, of course, is myself. Um, I'm the CEO and senior engineer. Samantha Jewel Fao, who is the Director of Innovation and also the author of Be Decent Environmental Activism 2.0, and Heather Croshaw, who is our Environmental Law and Policy Specialist. So um, in the past few decades, we've all been concerned one way or another uh, about the changes in our climate, global warming, and the impact of global warming. And the hard truth is the problem is real still here, and worst of all, it's not, you know, it's not going anywhere. It just keeps getting worse. Um, so, you know, we've seen the current changes in weather with the flooding in Europe and the snowstorm in Texas recently. You know, the climate is aggressively changing and we don't have the infrastructure um, to handle these changes or enough knowledge to mitigate future damage. Um, our goal today really is to provide you with some insight around the climate situation and the steps you can take to make a positive impact on the climate and achieve environmental sustainability. Here, we're looking at the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, in 2015, the UN created the sustain 17 Sustainable Development Goals and it was like a plan of action for people, planet and prosperity. And the SDG goals are really um, to strengthen uh, universal peace, enlarge our freedom and eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions. More also, the SDGs seek to develop strategies to improve health and education, reduce inequality, and of course, tackle climate change by working to preserve our oceans and forests. And as we go through our slides today, you know, through this webinar, we will demonstrate how climate change impact is directly tied to most of the UN SDGs. So we're gonna go over climate change impacts, decentralized technology, environmental, environmental mandates, and of course our action plan. So um, with understanding climate change you know, impacts, we look at three different SDGs that are directly tied to it. There's more, of course, but these three main SDGs, climate action, SDG 13, life below water, SDG 14, and life on land, SDG 15, are all directly related to um, climate change impact, mainly because, of course, life below water depends on how much we're using and um, what we're doing with the ocean and how the ocean is being impacted, the pollution rate and whatnot. Life on land really relates to agriculture mostly in trying to sustain a good environment for, for, for living on earth. And it's, of course, climate action is what we're trying to do right now, doing our best to really help the situation. So there are three main areas that we see, you know, and there's more, but these three main areas that we are pulling out today is ecological, societal, and economic. Um, with ecological, impacts, there's floods, there's desertification. Those are just a very few examples of the ecological impacts. Societal impacts, of course, climate migration, health and disease. If we don't have the infrastructure to support the current changes that we're experiencing right now, um, then we're gonna be having issues with hygiene by water pollution. We're going to have more spreading of diseases. Um, we're gonna have infrastructural issues, um, you know, uh, buildings collapsing, mm -hmm. things happening around the world, people, floods, you know, destroying buildings and people's homes. And of course that also leads to migration due to climate change. Um, many people that lose their, their homes during a disaster have to find somewhere else to live. Most of them migrate. 
Um, then you have economic, of course, supply chain disruption where, you know, food is being disrupted. But we've seen what happened in the pandemic, pandemic recently and how, um, you know, a pandemic could affect disruption, you know, the supply chain for food and even just products and services. So that those are just really things that are happening today that are impacting us directly. Um, a good example here is basically coffee, right? So just looking at coffee, uh, we all consume coffee on a daily basis, most of us at least. 75% um, of Uganda's coffee crop is expected to decrease um, over the next few years. Um, there, there's a potentially going to be a loss of 25% suitable land for coffee um, and declining overall yield. So that's just an example of one um, food that we consume on a regular basis that will be impacted um, and currently is being impacted. As far as migration, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the movement of people from one area to another due to climate change you know, issues. So this, these are just examples of the types of impacts that we will experience. All right, so I hand it over to Samantha Fow, who's going to introduce herself again and talk about decentralized technology. Thank you so much, Asma. I appreciate your overview and your robust introduction. Yes, again, my name is Samantha Jewel Fowl. I am the author of a book called Be Decent, Environmental Activism 2.0. And it's very much about creating solutions to the environmental problems that we are facing that seem so massive. And these solutions themselves are not global in scale, but rather modular. Um, and so if we uh, can go ahead and go to the next slide, we can get into what decentralized technology is and how we use it, right? So. What is decentralized technology? Decent tech, um, that's, that's the shorthand that I enjoy to use, using for it because you know it's marketing and it's interesting and um, people are, are more engaged when it's more accessible. So what is decent tech? Decent tech is a response to an observation that our lives are digitized and virtualized. Uh, and as much as our environment functions within ecological, social, and, environment, and environmental systems um, that exist very much in the real life. There are digital and virtual technologies that can be used to positively impact these systems. So Decent Tech provides modular, individualized solutions to massive climatological and environmental challenges. At the same time, because we are all interconnected, uh, we are able to improve the access of environmental availability information, the availability of environmental information, as well as community engagement and general uh, you know, generally how people are uh, engaging with the climate change issues that are facing them right now and every day. <clears throat> Many of these examples are uh, hardware devices and some are software devices. Uh, so for, you know, just a few examples, solutions for climate refugees, climate migration. Uh, we are already seeing people displaced globally, not just in conflict zones, but all around the world. In Europe, in the United States, uh, we need to be prepared for climate migration, and that's going to create challenges in terms of access to resources, identification for displaced individuals, and of course, distributed banking, right? It's, it's no longer just a matter of hopping in your car and going to your local credit union. UN Women and has collaborated with universities and private stakeholders to create a, a device called the ID Box. This is a solar powered digital identity and virtual wallet device that runs on blockchain technology that individuals who have been displaced by climate change or other needs for forced migration can use to create the infrastructure, the individual infrastructure they need to rebuild their lives. And these are again, devices that can be created and handed out and utilized without any degree of centralized control or, or monitoring or supervision. We also see these same solutions cropping up all over transportation, uh, home and personal devices, uh, as well as electrical energy access. Uh, block charge is another example of a piece of hardware that integrates blockchain technology to support electric vehicle charging. So electric vehicles require a substantial draw from the power grid, and there's a lot of countries that simply do not have the infrastructure that is necessary to support that amount of electrical conveyance. 
Block charge is P2P, it's person to person. It's private technology that is installed and facilitated by the same community of people that care deeply about access to electrical energy and have the resources uh, to support that. Uh, not all of the decent tech that we talk about is uh, hardware devices, right? A lot of it exists purely in the digital world. Uh, that is true of the IBM Plastic Bank. IBM has an incredibly robust blockchain that they have built all sorts of decent tech solutions around. One of my favorite is their Plastic Bank. It is an actual virtual platform that is build, built, again, using blockchain technology that involves virtual currency, digital currency, just like the cryptocurrency that uh, so many people are being you know, drawn into through the trends of Bitcoin and things like that. Um, but this particular digital currency that is uh, portrayed on the plastic bank is traded in for, for pieces of plastic. So individuals who are participating can actually go in, they can go and collect pieces of plastic litter from the ocean, from the land, from their communities, uh, and they can trade it in for a fungible, fungible digital currency. Uh, IBM, is, as I said, has a robust blockchain, and they have also been working on lots of solutions across renewable and climate mitigation uh, systems, including carbon trading. The same, the same system that has allowed to that has allowed IBM to create a marketplace for plastic trash is also being utilized to create a strong and robust marketplace for carbon tax and trading. Um, well, Samantha, thank you so much for giving us this fantastic overview about decent tech. So we're just going to go quickly over to global mandates. Thanks, Samantha. Mm -hmm. um, Heather, please, uh, can you walk us through that? Thank you, Asma. And as you discussed earlier, uh, the climate change impacts are already affecting our lives and our planet. And Samantha discussed solutions to help stop the climate crisis through decent tech. So the other aspect that we need to think about is how we can use environmental mandates to help change behaviors. And that is both on the government levels all the way down to the individual consumer. The future of the planet and our society is in peril. The climate crisis is already here. So we have to push our policymakers at every level of government to act on climate now. So first let's discuss the international level. So the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change also referred to as UNFCCC. Uh, the most recent um, major agreement is the Paris Agreement that was passed in on December 12th, 2015. This is a legally binding international treaty on climate change adopted by 196 countries at COP15 in Paris, France, entered into force on November 4th, 2014. So some of them, there's a, the Paris Agreement's a very large document, so I'm just only gonna go through a few highlights. Um, such as Article 2, which is the global goal. That is the global goal of maintaining a global warming at 2 degrees Celsius with the ideal goal of being 1.5 degrees Celsius. Decision makers decided uh, this level is this one of the safer levels um, to make sure the planet does not become in peril. And also parties agreed to keep enhancing ambition um, throughout the negotiations. The other two articles I'm mostly going to talk about are Article 4, which deals with mitigation. Um, this Paris Agreement implemented something rather novel called Nationally Determined Contributions, or known as NDCs. Um, this is a really unique collective action tool where countries per, um, pursue their own mitigation levels. They are updated every five years. Developed countries focus on economy-wide targets, whereas developing countries focus on enhancing mitigation efforts with the goal of moving towards economy-wide targets over time in the light of different national circumstances. Article seven deals with adaptation and there's also a global goal for adaptation. So basically uh, it's to enhance adaptive capacity, strengthen resilience and reduce vulnerability to climate change. And this is to be achieved through country level national adaptation plans, also known as NAPS, which were originally developed under the Cancun framework. These are country-driven planning developed every five years, and the first plans were already submitted in 2015. Um, Heather, your voice just drifted away really quickly. Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Sure. 
And um, so then other interesting articles in the Paris Agreement have to deal with um, finance, technology, capacity building. In particular, uh, countries agreed to uh, focus on climate finance and establish the world's largest climate fund called the Green Climate Fund, where developed parties contribute money to the Green Climate Fund with a global goal of 100 billion US dollars per year in contributions. And then for our purposes, Article 12 also focuses on training, education, public participation, public awareness, and access to information. And this is where um, developed country parties commit to submit information on future support every two years, including pro projected levels of public finance available for the Green Climate Fund, as well as international co cooperation on climate safe technology development, transfer and building capacity in the developing world. And then also part of global mandates will have policy and regulatory changes impacts. And this is increased litigation for requiring decarbonization. Uh, so lawsuits against governments and private actors in the US, uh, we can think about Massachusetts versus EPA landmark, landmark federal court case that forced the US to consider greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean Air Act as a threat to public health and welfare. There's also financial penalties for fossil fuel use, such as fines, and then carbon tax inflammation and trading programs, such as the one in California's cap and trade program. So countries are also doing um, climate change programs as well. We're using the Eastern African country of Uganda as an example. They are experiencing the impacts of climate change, and so they know that they need to act. So at the international level, they've already submitted their NDCs and their NAPs to the UNFCCC. They were submitted in 2015. And as you can see in adaptation, they focused on key areas of agriculture, infrastructure, energy, water, forestry, health, and risk management. And for mitigation, they're really focusing on energy, forestry, and wetlands. With And across these two programs, they're really focusing on cross-cutting issues of gender and human rights. And then they also established a national climate policy in 2015. And then the United States recently went through a change in their climate change policies uh, with the USA had left the Paris Agreement under the previous administration, but under the Biden administration, they officially rejoined the Paris Agreement on February 19th, 2021. Key priorities for this administration include a carbon-free power sector by 2035, a 50 to 52% reduction from 2005 levels in economy-wide net greenhouse gas pollution in 2030, and then also uh, zero net emissions by 2050. And then the Biden administration is also um, very keen on making sure that past environmental injustices are rectified. So he's implemented a um, new environmental justice initiative and this is a high priority for the Biden administration. And uh, this has been announced through the executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad that basically uh, intersects climate justice issues and climate change policy. Fantastic, thanks Heather, that, that's, that's good. So that's coming down the pipeline, okay. Good, good to know, right. thanks for the overview on the mandates. Um, so really, you know, at the end of the day, right? Okay, we, we know all this stuff happening, what do we do? Like, so, um, there has to be some kind of action plan. So how can we use climate change impact education, training advocacy to move forward into a sustainable climate future? Um, the ways we can do that is really by, we have, we have a four-step strategy and our four-step strategy is really assessment, development, training, and advocacy, where we assess um, the organization's current situation within um, the sustainability bubble and see where we are today and where we wanna be tomorrow. Um, develop custom workshops to educate um, and help uh, organizations really figure out what they want to do to um, move to a more sustainable situation. And then we train your workforce and facilitate and engage stakeholders to inform and promote climate action. And finally, we um, conduct outreach and community education on positive impacts, lessons learned, um, strategies and ways forward for actions that can help a more sustainable um, environment. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your, appreciate your participation and um, we hope to hear from you soon. And please look out for more webinars from us uh, in the near future. Thank you.